Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you today for this webinar. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA in Dublin. This event is the first in a series of webinars co-organized by the European Parliament Liaison Office in Dublin and the IIEA. The series will look at the outcomes of the conference on the future of Europe and will explore several critical issues for the future of the European Union, specifically democratic resilience today, the energy transition next month, and digitalization and the future of work in April. So keep an eye out on your emails for when those meetings will be scheduled. The event today explores the theme of building democratic resilience in the European Union. It's well documented how the EU is facing unprecedented challenges to the rule of law and democratic leg legitimacy, both from inside and outside of the Union. We're absolutely delighted to have a distinguished panel of expert speakers with us today who will consider how to build democratic resilience in the European Union in the face of internal and external threats and how to safeguard it. Each of our three speakers will, will provide introductory remarks of up to seven minutes, maybe a minute or two more, and then we'll go to Q&A with you, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion as ever using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we'll come to them once our speakers have finished their introductory remarks. You can also participate in the discussion on Twitter using the handle, the handle at IIEA, and I encourage you to do so. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. I'll now formally introduce our speakers and hand you over to them, uh, and they'll provide opening remarks in alphabetical order. I'll introduce the three of you in one go to allow the conversation to kick off. So first of all, we're going to hear from Daniel Freund, MEP. Daniel has been a member of the European Parliament for the German Greens since 2019. His main issues of interest include transparency, democracy, the fight against corruption and the future of the EU. Daniel is a member of the Constitutional and Budgetary Control Committees, and he leads the Greens' work on the Conference of the Future of Europe. And is a negotiator on the Independent Ethics Authority. Daniel chairs the European Parliament Cross-Party Working Group Against Corruption. After Daniel, we're going to hear from Billy Kelleher, MEP. Billy was elected to the European Parliament in 2019 also, representing the people of Ireland South, my home constituency. Billy is a former Irish Minister for Trade, Commerce and Industry. And prior to his election, Billy was the Fianna Fáil Party's national spokesperson on business, enterprise and innovation. Billy led his party's work on amending the constitution with regard to abortion rights. Billy serves as a full member of the Econ and Fisk committees, as a substitute member of the Envy Committee, responsible for health and environmental issues, and of the special Covey Committee, which looks at the impact of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons that should be learned from it. Billy was also a full member of the Annet Committee, which conducted an inquiry into the protection of animals in transport. Finally, after Billy, we're going to hear from Professor Calypso Nicolides. Calypso is Chair in Global Affairs at the School of Transnational Governance at EUI in Florence, where inter alia, she convenes the EUI Democracy Forum. She's currently on leave from the University of Oxford and was Professor at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and at the École Nationale d'Administration in Paris. She's worked at numerous EU institutions, including as a member of the European Council's Reflection Group on the Future of Europe, chaired by Philippe Gonzalez, and as a council member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Calypso has also served as advisor on European affairs to George Papandreou, the former Prime Minister of Greece in the 1990s and early 2000s, the Dutch and UK governments, the European Parliament, the European Commission, OECD and uh, UNCTAD. Calypso is also my uh, treasure colleague a number of times when I was working as an academic, so it's really wonderful to have you back here, Calypso. Daniel, Billy, Calypso, thank you very much for being with us. I'm going to hand first over to Daniel, and thanks again all for being with us. Well, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I think if we're, if we're speaking about democratic resilience uh, in the EU, there, there are two things, really, that, that I want to talk about in, in my introductory remark, where I fear we're, we're not quite there yet in protecting EU democracy. Um, the first thing that I would mention is if you look at international democracy rankings from the likes of Freedom House, which looks every year at the quality of democracies around the world, 
and the two countries where that quality is going down the fastest. So the two countries in the entire world where democracy is uh, going down the drain the quickest are two EU member states, are, are Poland and, and Hungary. And the union, you know, a peace project, but also a club of democracies, that we have a situation in the in the past 10 years or so where where now all of a sudden our democracies are are turning into you know what the european parliament now qualifies as an electoral autocracy in hungary is is really quite a, a bad development uh, we have situations in eu member states you know where elections are no longer fully democratic and, and not fair we have NGOs being thrown out of countries, universities being thrown out. We have, uh, you know, a situation in Hungary where independent journalism almost has gone extinct, uh, where the independence of judiciary is heavily undermined, uh, both in Hungary and Poland. And, and so far, the EU has struggled uh, to, to cope with that situation. I, I was one of those MEPs that negotiated the so-called rule of law conditionality, so the, the tool that now allows us to freeze EU funding for those countries where we have rule of law shortcomings and where corruption is rampant. Uh, that law entered into force well over two years ago, and it has taken us almost two years to pressure the Commission into actually using the tool. Uh, we had to first start uh, an inactivity lawsuit against the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to convince her to finally use this tool uh, in the case of Hungary. Uh, but but finally, before Christmas last year, uh, there there was after this long fight a decision in in the council among the governments of member states to to freeze funding uh, to Hungary, and uh, today, if we actually look both well under this uh, under this tool, but also under different tools, today we have about two thirds to three quarters of the funding for Hungary and Poland that is on ice and will only be released if there are reforms on, on anti-corruption, on rule of law uh, in, well, in both countries of, of Hungary and Poland. Uh, it's taken us a long time, but I think this is a huge success for the European Parliament, an effort that was done cross-party, uh, cross-country, uh, cross uh, where I've worked very closely with you know, conservatives from, from Finland, social democrats from Spain, uh, liberals from Hungary, from Germany, uh, to 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 make this happen and um well the big question now is does it work uh, will we see the necessary reforms in those member states but at least what we know now is that uh, we we no longer fund the destruction of democracy with eu funds you know that is something that we have done for far too long we have enriched uh, the close family and friends of viktor orban uh, for for far too long um so, so on that one, I would say, you know, we, we've come late to the game, but at least there are uh, developments now. The second thing that I want to mention is obviously what we have seen in the European Parliament uh, since since December, right? I mean, we look, we we have known for many years that there are dictators with lots of money out there that seek to influence decision making in the EU and and also in the Parliament. We have seen it with Azerbaijan. We have seen it with Russia. Uh, probably others as well, but the case uh, around Eva Kaili and others uh, that, that has been revealed by the Belgian authorities is ha has been shocking. Uh, we're, we're still actually trying to find out, uh, you know, what exactly uh, have they tried to influence and, and has it worked? We have just set up, or if you want, extended the mandate of, uh, of a special committee uh, to look into that in, in, in more detail. And obviously the investigations by the Belgian authorities continue. But I think what this has underlined, uh, something that, that the, the Foreign Influence Committee had said also in the past, is that European democracy is vulnerable uh, to, uh, to undue influence uh, from, from outsiders. Uh, I think there has long been also a discussion about undue influence from lobbyists, of course. Um, and, and I think there's more that we can do to protect European democracy from the influence of, of money, uh, from the influence of, of third countries that don't necessarily want to do uh, as, as good things uh, or, or support European democracy.
democracy. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, there, there have been since December a number of resolutions now in the European Parliament where we have outlined some reforms. The, the Parliament's president, uh, Roberta Metzola, has also suggested uh, reforms that have been endorsed uh, by, by the majority of political groups in the House. So I really hope uh, that that we learn our lesson, that we uh, change things here, and that we start gaining back uh, some some of the trust we we certainly have lost uh, since since December. Um, so yeah, I think in 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 that sense, uh, there there is a need still to improve the resilience of European democracy, uh, both inside the European Union, but also towards those that uh, seek to unduly influence it from the outside. Daniel, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, Billy Keller, Fulcherov, Slatson Torler. Gordon Mahagut, Fulcherov Galer. Just to say at the outset, uh, thanks very much. I'm not quite sure how long I've speak. So um, is it five, ten? You have up to about seven minutes, but if you're, okay, if, you're okay. if you're inspired, you have a bit longer. Yeah, right, if I can inspire you all. Yeah, just to say at the outset, I mean, when we talk about democratic resilience in the European Union, or when we just talk about democratic resilience in general, I think we have to start at the very basics. Uh, I mean, primarily, uh, democracy is based on a very simple principle. That's trust between those that are elected and those that elect. Uh, and that is the very essence of what most democratic systems uh, function on, is that, that trust that people will vote for politicians based on certain uh, manifestos. They will, they, will, they will comply with the laws of the land. They will comply with the ethics in the office. They won't abuse the office for enrichment. And effectively, they will, the quid pro quo is that they will try and improve the lot of the people as a collective in terms of advancement to societies. It's a fairly straightforward concept that's been made very complicated by politicians in general because of the human nature factor coming into being um, and, you know, the, the, the risks to um, corruption, um, the attractions that, and, and, you know, that can be put in, people's, uh, in front of people's paths that may um, cor corrupt an individual or as can be seen in some cases, just referenced by Daniel, where the entire body politic of the government apparatus becomes uh, corrupted. Uh, and that really is, I suppose, the start of the conversation. Now, the, the end of the conversation is how do you put systems in place to guarantee uh, you know, th these predictor things? And I think obviously, and I speak at it now from a, a cocooned position. I mean, in Ireland, we've actually had a functioning democracy for a hundred years. We've had uninterrupted democracy since 1921. Uh, we never had any problems in transfer of power from one political party to another uh, when we've had continuous functioning democracy. So, but I mean, in the European context, that is quite a long time when you look at what has happened uh, since uh, the, the, you know, the First World War, right through skirting through with, with um, fascism, uh, nationalism, communism, and, 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 and other entities as well. But I, I think that, one of the cornerstones that we have to nurture and ensure is protected is the media. We need an independent, well-resourced media. And one of the difficulties we have now is that due to um, the advent of social media, due to the advent of the internet itself, um, and the broadening out of people's accessibility to various newsways and news pathways, and just access to information in general, or access to disinformation, the capacity of the traditional media and investigative journalism, for example, has been greatly diminished due to resources or lack of resources. And I just think it's an area that the European Union will have to look at collectively is how do we, without interfering um, with uh, the freedom and integrity of journalists, how do we ensure there is a well-resourced, independent, investigative, uh, journalistic uh, uh, entity across the entirety of the European Union that can go about its work. That has always been the case in terms of keeping uh, governments accountable and keeping systems uh, honest and with integrity. And that is just an area I think that, that we are weak at the moment. The difficulty, of course, is that people are now accessing most of their um, media through social media or most of their information through social media. And as we have seen, uh, social media it has been and is, you know, is disseminating as much disinformation and misinformation as it is uh, disseminating fact. And that's just something that we have to uh, address as well in a, in a meaningful way. So, I mean, my priority would be in terms of trying to ensure we've resilience built into the system is to build resilience into the systems that keep democracies accountable 
and they are primarily independent media. And of course, as Denny referred to as well, the independent judiciary. And all, like it is almost a given that whenever you see a, a party in government uh, and it then mentioning that it's going to address issues in the constitutional courts or the Supreme Courts, it's going to change its makeup or how they're appointed. Uh, more often than not, they are done to advantage a government rather than anything else. And you see that right across uh, the globe where uh, governments in recent years have been, you know, changing the construct of constitutional courts or uh, Supreme Courts. And that runs right through the entire judicial system then as well. Um, and that really saps the confidence of citizens believing that they have their uh, rights vindicated or entities believing that they'll have their rights uh, vindicated in the in the event of they having a, 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 an argument or a falling out with the government. And like when I say government, you see the difficulty is I look at governments benignly because we've had a functioning democracy. Many citizens look at governments in a very different way because they are not benign governments in the sense that they interfere very much, not only in individuals' lives through oppressive legislation and policies, but through um, um, undermining the independence of the media and the judiciary. The other area I think that we, we really have to look at is the, the, the impression or the intent uh, and, and how people view politics. And um, again, Daniel referred to Qatar Gate and Morocco Gate. Of course, if you put 705 people in a room, um, you know, you can be fairly safe in saying that there's going to be one that at the very least uh, may, may not uh, live to the ethical standards that the other 704 uh, expect uh, and uh, presume. But um, there is a weakness in our systems in the sense that if you are um, or want to be corrupted and you make yourself available, there's entities out there that are more than willing to buy politicians. So there has to be sanction, uh, but I think primarily the sanction must most definitely be on the politicians themselves. Uh, we need to ensure that if politicians are found to have uh, abused our position, either in a corrupt way or, or, or ethically, um, that there is a, a severe sanction. Of course, there is a debate now going on in Europe as well, and this is something I just think we have to tread carefully with. I've made this case very often, you know, oh well, politicians sh lobbying, that lobbying shouldn't be allowed or lobbying must be very controlled. And yes, lobbying should be open and transparent, but politicians should be, in my view, the ones as individuals who decide they meet and do not meet. I don't think that we can have somebody that says, well, you can't meet this group or that group. And I bear, I, I, and I will say this quite publicly and openly, like, um, you know, I, I meet uh, groups that other countries would view as, 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 as potential terrorists. Because I have a political philosophy, a political view on the oppression of some people, but some countries and some politicians in the parliament would hold a very contrary view to me. Now, I, and I said this when I was in Dáil Éireann, and I say it again, democracy and lobbying, interacting with individuals, with organisations is a part and parcel of the democratic process. What must be done is that I must be fully transparent. In other words, the people I meet, the public should know I met them. Uh, and, and, and that's that's a given. And um, the issue then, of course, of inducements and payments, um, it is very hard to legislate for that because if a person is inherently corrupt, uh, they can take the suitcase of, of, of money and, and move on. But in the event that they're being found out, there must be very severe criminal sanctions as well, not just uh, expulsion from your political grouping or that you can't stand in the next election. There has to be a more meaningful uh, sanction than, than, than that. And I think we certainly have a way to go in that particular area. So they will be my thoughts on it. I just think that finally, we have to get to grips as well with the whole issue of disinformation, misinformation. We saw it through COVID and people can have their own individual views um, uh, on you know vaccines and uh, the, the veracity of them, the, efic the efficiency of them, the effectiveness of them. But I mean, some of the commentary around that, for example, was incredible. You take, for example, even recently around the whole issue of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Again, um, people can have varying views as to why it happened, how it happened, but there is definites, uh, you know, in it. And when you look at some of the commentary, even within the European Parliament and from members, you know, it, it does not necessarily tally with, with the reality. Of course, the, the, the downside to that is once you start censoring what people say, we're then into a whole new space then again, where it could become very oppressive by politicians deciding who I can meet as a politician in terms of meeting people that want to inform me about something or what I can say. And then that is uh, back to where I started. 
the integrity of the individual politician and trying to ensure that that is the starting point for, for, for democracy in the first instance. And once you start falling foul of that, that there's strong sanctions. Camila, Billy, just before I invite Calypso in, I just wanted to put it to Daniel. If you have anything to say, Daniel, regarding what Billy was saying about who MEPs can or can't meet, um, perhaps you don't, but given that you're also in office, I wonder if you have anything to say about the current rules and norms in the EP about who MEPs can, can spend time with. No, I, I fully agree that uh, lobbying and meeting interest representatives is a, is a part of any of any democracy. We need transparency and we need some behavioral rules of what's allowed and what's not allowed. Mm. Lobbying for me or, you know, in a democracy, we need the exchange of arguments. What we don't necessarily need is that uh, those arguments come uh, with a Michelin star restaurant dinner or uh, with a luxury trip that the lobbyist flies you out to New York uh, to to make his argument. I, I think on those things, uh, you know, we should talk. Uh, what where exactly the the boundaries lie but that you know when when we want to create you know i fight for a greener european future but it means that that transition out of fossil fuels we also need to negotiate that with the fossil fuel companies so it's normal you know that we discuss with the mm -hmm. coal miners companies and and uh, big oil and whatnot that it's it's necessarily part but we shouldn't yeah. only be talking to them also need to talk to the environmental NGOs, to the labor unions, to whoever else has something to say about uh, the specific law or, or decision. Cool. Very clear. Thank you, Daniel, after putting you on the spot there. Uh, Calypso, our final speaker, I'm going to hand over to you for, for seven or eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, if I can just say Calypso, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I meant to say from the outset, I just got I distracted myself, of course. Um, we're all, all our thoughts are, of course, with the people of Greece today after the terrible tragedy in, in Larissa. I just meant to say that. And as one of my, my Greek friends, and given the kind of theme of today and that we're all Europeans, I just want to acknowledge that. And we're, we're, we're all thinking about that, that terrible tragedy. Sorry, Calypso, over to you. Well, thank you for your thoughts there, Barry. And indeed, that train from Athens to Thessaloniki is one that I have taken quite a few times. Not the best of trains, but... Um, you know, really, but we, we, we see all these tragedies, we feel powerless. And perhaps that's a bridge between your thoughtful words and our conversation today. You know, indeed, at the end of the day, democracy is about power and who has power and who shares it and who doesn't want to share it. And, um, and indeed, I think Billy was very right in, in, in um, stressing the importance of trust. Because if, if some people, call them the people and some other people call them politicians, bureaucrats, heads of companies, um, have a power contract. Other people are untrusted with the power that citizens give them. The question is in that exchange of power, constituent power versus um, operational power, real power, you know, what is the trust link? And, and Billy, I would say that um, yes, one has to deserve the trust, but of course, in a democracy, there shouldn't be blind trust, right? It's not like, you know, with your parents or children, and even in families, there is no blind trust. So if there's no blind trust, maybe there's, there should be something called binding trust, a trust that is made of mutual interaction, real transparency, and indeed sometimes distrust um, that makes you watch the, the other side. I'll say something about that. But at the end of the day, you need citizens need ownership. And so when we are talking today about democratic resilience, um, it's an interesting word, right? Because it assumes that um, we have democracy and it's about defending it. Indeed, there's been a connotation recently that it's resilience against external shocks. It's like monetary union. Is it resilient? You know? Um, and so it's a, it is very clear from what you've both said and what we all think that there's this kind of interesting link, the outside in, inside out. How is the, because the democratic resilience these days is all about, you know, Russia intervening secretly or not, not so secretly in our elections. Disinformation, as, as you were just saying, Billy. Um, so it has to do, so, so that's the core thing. And in fact, the commission just came up indeed with this democracy package. Um, which is centered around this idea of dem democratic resilience. Initially, it was very much on this kind of reacting to the outside. Um, 
And, in, and indeed, here's the first example of the outside and inside out, because if you want to be resilient vis-a-vis -vis disinformation and, in, and um, all of the strategies we know from the outside, well, you, you know, the best, what's the best um, tool? What is the best uh, defense? It's really educated citizens. Right. And it is indeed Billy's right, the media, because the media helps educate, but it's also the school, it's also the, the whole system. Um, politicians, uh, the Daniels of this, Daniel is brilliant at, at being pedagogical, you know, with, with citizens, but also in conversation. So we need to think of the fabric of our societies when we talk about resisting external different dis differentiated um, intervention and disinformation. And then, of course, we've got the crisis mode, the Qatar gate. You both talked about it. Yes. The, how can we be democratically resi resilient when the you know, rot is in the apple, as it were? And this has to do both with you know, um, how, whether our, uh, in, internally our citizens can trust their politicians, not just about exter external interference, but indeed lobbies, internal interference. Um, I mean, I hear both of you saying some, yes, that things are being done. And Danielle, a lot of it is you have done amazing work, you know, in the ethics committee, in the parliament, you, we, we all get your, you know, wonderful, you know, uh, accounts of what's going on. But are you, are we sure that enough is going to be done? Um, Alberto Alemano, just uh, my dear colleague, wrote a, a wonderful op-ed on, on all, he, he already thinks it's a missed opportunity. You know, I may, maybe I don't want to go too far, but will the commission continue to be judge and party with its ethics committee? Um, you know, who exactly is guarding the guardians? I mean, there's a big, big questions. And don't we need to wonder about whether, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a few bad apples. Yeah, yeah, there are some bad apples, but is the system resilient? And indeed, you both said, well, we need to meet lobbies. And, and I know that's the majority thinking. But Judge Kleiss the other day, and just for our, those in our um, um, listening to us who don't know who he is. He is the fearless uh, Belgian judge who's uh, who's um, adjudicating the the case of Qatar Gate, and one of the. You know, and he he asked the other day on French television, "Why do you even need to meet? Why can't they all put their information or maybe a video, you know, on the platform in the internet? Because what you're, you're both saying is, well, citizens should know that we meet. Well, yeah, it's one thing to know what you, that you meet, but." What is being said? Why shouldn't the whole of citizenry listen in, as it were, let them post stuff? At least that's not me speaking, that's Judge Clay's. So no need to meet, no need to uh, offer information on paper towels in restaurants, but information on platform and paper is enough. And I know, Danielle, you just said we don't want to go to the restaurant, but you know what I'm saying. So there, maybe we can be use this moment in time to be even more radical, uh, given the Qatar day. This is the moment. And there, are, you know, lobbies are not all bad lobbies. They do provide information, absolutely. But how? And who knows? And that brings me to the next point, my my third point, which is that um, Billy talked about the media and the importance of the media, and I couldn't agree with you more because, well, what we need is sunshine laws, right? We need everything to be hyper visible. In uh, and and sorry i'm <laughs> just having to kind of switch around given my background um and so what we need here is i what i have called a democratic panopticon where the citizens are in the center and you always know whether you're a bureaucrat or politicians in company that you are being watched one way or another or you know maybe not but you don't know that's that that is subverting a really negative connotation of panopticon into a positive connotation and that connotation tells us that yes the media needs access so we have follow the money is very happy now because of the wonderful evolution we had again thanks to daniel and his friends in the european parliament that the first hundred uh, recipients of uh, recovery fund uh, the big monies coming into the member states from the EU, they should be on the web and everybody should know where they are. Let's push this all the way. EU money, everybody know, should know where it goes, to whom. And that would be a, a democratic panopticon, not just for journalists, yes, for journalists who are fearless in pursuing this, but also citizens, uh, uh, CSOs, etc. And that leads me to my uh, you know, last point, um, linked to everything Danielle so brilliantly said about electoral autocracy, Hungary, etc., um, where, you know, indeed, we still have, 
bad news. It, the point is, it's not just two countries, right? <laughs> um, yes, they're the worst. They're really problematic. But all of our countries have problems with the rule of law. And that sh is shown very well by the Commission's country report on the 27 countries. And this is also why, whether it's rule of law, democracy, you know, our young people in Europe, uh, half of them believe autocracy would be better at dealing with the problems they care about, like climate change. Uh, many of them believe that maybe we should replace politicians with AI, um, you know, uh, algorithms. Uh, that's maybe one third. You know, whoa, I'd be worried about that. But at the end of the day, you know, we I think we all agree that um, what we need is really de all out democratic innovation. Yes, the representative democracy in the EP and national parliaments remains critical. But we also want to, and I hope we can get to this, um, Barry, that we can actually talk about those innovations that the EU is innovating. And of course, Ireland, uh, with deliberative democracy, randomly chosen citizens, um, being a fourth branch of government. And Ireland has shown the way. My big hope, uh, Barry, is that this can be provide an example for the EU. So I'll have more to say about this, but my time is up. Thanks, as ever, Calypso. I have um, questions to put to, to each of you. There's also been a flurry of questions online, but I just want to invite each of you. There's no obligation, but going in the same order that we that we introduced you, Daniel, Billy, Calypso, do any of you want to respond to what any of the other panelists have said yet, or should we go straight to the questions? Just, just, just can I can I say please, Billy. Yeah, sorry, in terms of what Calypso said around the issue of interactions and whether it should be all done on platform, you know, lobbying should be done on platform, etc. Uh, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I come from a representative de de democratic concept of, you know, um, that in eight um, very personal relation between the public representative and the constituent. Uh, I mean, I sat in all my political life for 30 years, I sit in town halls in the back of public houses, um, community centres, in offices, uh, uh, holding advice centres. And I, I don't discern, or I don't decide who comes in the door. Anybody can come to see me. And they do come to see me, and they come to see me with personal problems, they come to see me with political problems, they come to see me as whistleblowers. Um, they may not be authentic, they may be. I don't judge. But I mean, I think once you start to diminish the ability of a, of a, of a politician to interact in that very sacrosanct uh, way with a constituent, you undermine a very central concept uh, of democracy, and that's representative democracy. So uh, what I'm saying is like, you know, if you are meeting NGOs or organizations, all those things should be declared. I agree with Daniel. You don't have to meet them in New York, you know, you can you can meet them online. You you but like the idea that there'd be something that would police or adjudicate who I should and should not meet uh, would be very damaging. I'll give you some example. There's people in the parliament who have a very fundamentally different view to me and the people, the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinians uh, uh, struggle. Others will take a different view. They come to the European Parliament. I meet them. Um, should I not be allowed to meet them? Because they are uh, a political entity that some people may not uh, agree with. So you, you, start, you start policing then and deciding who politicians can meet. And that is also a slippery slope that I would be just reluctant to, 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 to go down. One of the real fun things in the EP, obviously, is we all come from different political traditions and there's no political tradition more intimate than the Irish one. So that's a kind of a familiar view that Billy would share with a lot of politicians in Ireland. What do you think, Daniel, regarding the uh, the idea of stuff taking place in, in, in public or in, in, in private when meeting different entities? I think, um, I mean, personal meetings are, are absolutely vital to, to the work we do. Uh, and you know, if if I now try to think when, you know, when I try to form myself on, you know, what is the rule of law situation in Poland or Hungary, it's it's so different whether I read a report or even an email that a Polish judge or prosecutor might send me with, you know, the 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 story that they have lived through. But it's so much different when I when I sit uh, with them in in Warsaw, in Budapest, anywhere else in those two countries. And, and see, you know, what does it do? What does this attack on our mm. fundamental rights, on the rule of law? What does that actually mean for people? What does it mean when you go to a soup kitchen uh, outside of Budapest to see, you know, those people that 
you know, because an unfair decision is taken, uh, no longer gets the EU funds that they're uh, that they're entitled to because the government is stealing or misallocating the funds. You know, it's very different whether you see that firsthand uh, and talk to the people or or whether you send an uh, an email. I'm very much for for transparency. You know, I think those meetings should be published when anyone has outside activities or interests that should be published. And, and there should be rules of what you're allowed and what you're not allowed. You know, there should be a threshold on what is a gift okay to accept and what, what is definitely mm. beyond uh, any standard for anyone to, to, to accept that. But I, I also agree what, what Billy said, there, there needs to be uh, the possibility for, for us politicians to have uh, intimate meetings. I, I also wouldn't advocate that any any meeting I take should be web streamed or, or, or out in public. People need to be able to bring me confidential information. You know, I'm a, I, I work particularly on budget control. I, I work on wherever EU money is wasted. So I am heavily reliant on people that against, you know, uh, th their bosses or something, they bring me stuff where things are going wrong, where money is being mismanaged, where money is being mis mm. misused, you know. And and if 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 I have a camera in my office that that web streams everything, those people are no longer going to come, and and that makes the co the fight against corruption harder. Uh, you know, I think whistleblowers need to be protected. I I certainly think that some of my colleagues that work, for example, on on human rights. Uh, in Iran, in, in other places in the world where people will face the death penalty if it comes out that they have spoken to this or that member of the European Parliament. You know, I, I think those are all valuable exception, but obviously this doesn't prevent us from, you know, wh whenever I meet Google or Facebook or Volkswagen or Ikea, you know, that that goes on a register on the website of the European Parliament for anyone to see. And then my constituents can say, look, Daniel, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, your your meetings aren't balanced. Uh, you need to pay mm -hmm. better attention, you know, not to only meet this or that group. You also need to uh, to speak more to academics or NGOs or or whatever. Um, There's low. Sorry, Christopher, please. Yeah, you need to give me an opportunity because you can see that I'm a poor, lonely, lowly academic and you two are beautiful, brilliant politicians because that's like the art of misdirection. Because, of course, you know that I didn't say you shouldn't really, I mean, so far from me, the idea that you shouldn't have these intimate meetings with your constituents or, Daniel, that you shouldn't meet a, a secretly, you know, opponents that would risk their life. But I think you both know that this is not what I said, of course, and you should, you know, meet with all sorts of people in all sorts of circumstances. Um, I think that, and and moreover, I was trying to uh, to to um, explain the view, the position I heard Judge Kleist said. So I'm not even speaking myself. I am actually quoting a very respected uh, Belgian judge. My understanding is that he starts from the fact that the annual lobbying budget. Uh, annual bu lobbying budget is five million in Europe uh, in the, of of the big big companies from the chemical in chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, etc., and that they have a huge firing power. N next to them, the lowly, pure little NGOs, CSOs, you know, individuals trying to meet you, they're they're nothing. Now you're you two are you know absolutely pure and hands clean and not corrupt. That's not the problem, but we do know that they they spend a lot of money, including in the European Parliament. It's those that do spend a lot of money in various ways. It's not, it's not usually in bags of cash, as we've seen, yes, but there are all sorts of ways. Why shouldn't that specifically be transparent? After all, if they have interesting things to say about how big pharma has become totally green, why can't they say it in public? Um, so again, I am really targeting specific types of lobbies, not your average constituent or, or, or people who need to be protected. I think we need to be very clear about this. I, I'm sure this is not going to be our whole conversation, Barry, but I did want to make that I clear. I know. As much as I, I wish it was, and I, I already am brimming with questions for the three of you, so let's hopefully do this again at some point. But we have a bit of time left, and you're all busy people. So I've harvested questions on the following themes, misinformation, corruption, the EU and the member states, and the Belt and Road Initiative. I want to get through each of those. There's more. But I think uh, we'd be lucky if we get through those four topics. So starting with a question from Derek Mooney, which I'll read out for the audience. 
Hello, Derek. Thank you for being with us. The question goes, how do we address deliberate misinformation by member state governments? Visit Budapest and you'll find countless government funded posters and billboards falsely claiming that 93% oppose Russian sanctions, blaming Brussels for forcing these sanctions and propagating a blatant untruth. So the, the standard tension between Brussels and the member states. Do any of you want to take that one? I can say uh, something about that. Um... I mean, the, the, the media situation in, in Hungary is really dire. You go outside of Budapest, you will not find a newspaper, a radio or a TV channel that is basically not controlled uh, by, by Viktor Orban. Uh, and unfortunately, he, he uses his control of the media uh, to spread uh, an enormous amounts of lies. And actually on anything concerning Russia and Ukraine, it's basically pretty much Russia today in Hungarian uh, that, that is being broadcast. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do about that? Um, so, so one thing is obviously that we can, uh, you know, e use EU funds uh, to uh, support independent uh, journalism in, in Hungary. We're doing a little bit of that. I think we could be doing much more. I actually think, uh, you know, we have public media in pretty much every member state. And I have been wondering for a while, why isn't there European public media? You know, the same way, whatever, that the BBC in the, in the UK and ARD and ZDF in Germany and whatever, France Television in France, you know, why, why aren't we funding quality journalism with a European perspective? Because it's something different whether you report, you know, in your German context or your Irish context. You know, going looking at, at, at Europe and European problems with a European lens, I, I think would be would be a big improvement to European democracy. So so I'm quite in favor of that, but, uh, you know, it needs the majorities, it needs the funding. We are currently working on something called the Media Freedom Act. Uh, so a law that has been proposed by the European Commission to ensure that there is more media pluralism and media freedom and better protection of independent journalism in the member states. Uh, you know, the negotiations here in the parliament are just starting. I fear that the law doesn't go far enough to, to break up, uh, for example, the, the almost full control of the media landscape in Hungary, but it is, you know, improving th some things in the, in the right direction. One problem we, and you see it with the Media Freedom Act that we often have in Europe is when you're suggesting sort of European oversight, there is immediately a number of member states that will say, yeah, no, but we have no problem in our country. Why should I uh, now submit uh, German public television to European oversight or something. And, you know, it is sometimes a challenge when you're making the same rules that, that should apply to, to everyone, but the situation in the member states being vastly different. And, and sometimes then they feel like, you know, uh, if, if you're trying to address a problem that is, you know, very much so in, in a small number of member states, but not in the others, uh, doing legislation in a way, you know, that we eliminate the problem, but don't mm cause too much collateral can can sometimes be a uh, challenge. Um, I, th the next question I want to put directly to Calypso. So not everybody has to respond to every question, but I want to invite Billy with a chance to to speak to the, the question regarding misinformation if you want. Sorry, I think you're muted. Mo I'll move on. Sound. Yeah. I got the gesture. Thanks very much, Billy. Um, We've all mentioned, or sorry, you, you've all mentioned directly and indirectly the Qatargate scandal. And from uh, observing it as an interested party, I, I wasn't terribly surprised to, to to learn that this sort of that these sorts of things happen and these sorts of habits exist. But I'm still trying to assess the EP's response. And I, I wanted to give Calypso the chance, first of all. Can you speak at all to how the European Parliament, the European Union writ large, has responded to that scandal? Do you think it's robust enough? Has it identified major weaknesses in the system? Um, I, I, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the Parliament has been jolted into action, and Daniel mm -hmm. spoke to this. Um, it, it has put in place a number of safeguards. And, but I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say, and I hear I speak really under Daniel's kind of oversight, is that they're still working on it. Mm -hmm. So it would be a bit unfair to judge now. I think there are people worried. I, I mentioned my colleague from the good lobby, you know, Alberto Alemano, mm -hmm. who, you know, feels that it's not going far enough. I have spoken with the ombudsman and I know that 
and her office. I mean, I know they're hoping for more power on transparency. They're hoping overall for more transparency. Billy was speaking to the importance of transparency. Um, so at this stage, there is movement in the right direction, but I think there is a lot of CSOs and on, in mm. particular on tender hooks to see how far we're going to go here. Billy, Daniel, anything on specifically Qatargate? I know, Daniel, you're very interested in this given your um, your chairing of the cross-party working group against corruption, just to get the title. Would you like to say anything about Qatargate? I'll give Daniel and Billy I, a minute. I think, I mean, we, we have a number of commitments so far, uh, but... The, the actual work, the actual changing of rules, the uh, renegotiating agreements with commission and, and council when it comes, for example, to the lobby register, this is still ahead of us. So it, it seems that there has been since December a shift in, in the political will, definitely in the parliament. How much that's the case in the other institutions still remains to be seen and, and the actual changing of rules for the most part is, is still ahead of us. I'm I'm confident that we'll manage some stuff, uh, but we have also seen in the past, unfortunately, that you know when the public attention goes away, uh, with time uh, distance to the scandal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then th then the concerns uh, are are more prominent, and then all of a sudden people start start saying, you know, but do we really need to do this and that? Um, so 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 we'll see. The the thing that gives me hope is. Well, we have a European election coming up, uh, and we know from the past, you know, uh, the the chances for getting more transparency through ahead of European elections is it, it usually goes up. Billy, do you have a sense? Do you feel hopeful as Daniel does in the aftermath of the Qatar scandal, Qatar gets scandal? Yeah, well, I certainly believe now there is a, an acceptance in the European Parliament. What we need now is to get it across the major European institutions that transparency and just openness and accountability become part of everyday uh, political discourse and interaction. Uh, and it, it goes back to like, so, for example, that the, there is a lobbying register that, you know, you identify groups and organizations that you meet. I accept what uh, Calypso was saying as well about individuals, uh, you know, that we should be entitled to meet them and can that be. But like large organizations, like there should be a register. But at the end of the day, Let's be very honest. At the end of the day, if a person uh, decides to accept a suitcase of uh, banknotes, the, 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 what we must do is in the event of it being discovered is that there is harsh sanction. Mm. Like we can't just push it under the carpet and say, well, look, uh, and move on uh, and hope that people forget about it. There has to be harsh sanction. And of course, we have a difficulty in politics. A political chamber is a political chamber. It's not a tribunal or a court, so it can't convict people. Uh, so we can... Uh, politically condemn people but there has to be legislation in place for politicians as well so that when they are politically condemned there is also equally a criminal investigation and there's criminal sanction uh, so like the so like the idea that politicians can be criminal uh, can be politically condemned and then we all move on that's not good mm. enough there has to be criminal sanction as well I think uh, one, one thing I'd like to add, since we, we have a mostly Irish audience, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would assume, you know, if if the European Union could already follow the Irish example, you know, we have seen in, in the past, you know, I mean, you guys have done a, a, a lot of things with the, the introduction of the Irish lobby register, the creation of the ethics commissioner, uh, also the rules that have been introduced to, to protect whistleblowers in Ireland. I mean, there has been a consistent work over many years where, you know, I think partly also with the loss of trust uh, that, that you have seen following the financial crisis, there was a political will uh, to change laws and to introduce new rules that if the European Union would just come up to, to, to the Irish standard, so to speak, that, that would be a huge leap forward, uh, I think, for, for transparency and integrity in the EU institutions. Duly noted and really interested to hear that analysis. I'm going to loop two questions together just in the interest of time uh the they, the first one is from john o'hagan from trinity college dublin hello john thanks for being here i'll try and abridge as i go will it ever be possible to eject from the eu in extreme circumstances a member state for serious and, and unambiguous breaches of democratic principles such as for example is now the case in a country you've mentioned already over the course of this call hungary if not could the veto rule be relaxed in relation to any decision about reprimanding. I'm going to also just loop a, a similar question. It's similar but different. It comes from Andrea uh, Uncheazu. Thanks for being here, Andrea. 
I was wondering if the EP intends to continue the frozen funds plan for additional European Union countries, and at what point will the EU get involved in a country's corruption? Big questions, uh, and I yeah. see Daniel has unmuted, so I'll invite Daniel and then, then Calypso, if you wish, and then Billy. So, I mean, it's it's legally impossible at the moment uh, to kick a country out. Countries can, like the UK has done, decide freely to leave, but they cannot be ejected from the union. And I actually think, you know, if I look at Hungary, I don't think it would be a good idea to kick them out. It wouldn't actually solve the problem. First of all, you would, you know, punish uh, at least half of, of Hungarians that haven't voted for, for Orban, uh, and that would suffer the, the consequences. And also, you know, the, the, the moment that they're out, it doesn't fix the corruption. It doesn't fix, uh, you know, that hung Hungary is no longer a democracy. Mm -hmm. So I prefer, you know, putting all the pressure that we can on them to, to return on the path of democracy and, and rule of law rather than in a way, what, what might seem like the easy solution, uh, out they go, and then we don't have to deal with it. We we have seen in the past, you know, what dictators in our immediate neighborhood uh, are, are doing, uh, you know, Putin being the worst example. But even if you look at someone like Lukashenko, who with a plane and two buses puts the whole uh, European Union in, in disarray because he's mm -hmm. transporting uh, Iraqi uh, refugees to the Polish-Belarusian border, Orban would be just like that and, and go on our nerves, even if he if he wouldn't be in the union. I, I think the second example or the second proposal that's there is something that we really need to go after. Uh, Orban has been using the veto uh, like no one else. Uh, I, I saw a study just yesterday. There have been in the, in, in the past six years, uh, there have been 22 uses or threats of, of veto uh, among the governments. Uh, 17 of those 22 is, is Orban. Um, every time we, we do uh, Russia sanctions, every, you know, financial aid to Ukraine, even the global uh, tax deal, uh, now the NATO membership is, is mm -hmm. being blocked uh, by, by Orban because he, because he wants his money. And I think, uh, you know, we need to take it away from him. We should abolish uh, the, 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 the veto power. I think you know, we should decide with large majorities, but with with majorities, and not allow a single country uh, to to block us or blackmail us uh, in the future. Thanks, Daniel. As ever, clip. So I'll invite you to remark if if you wish, but there's never a pressure. Um, yeah, I'm I'm very uh, much in in phase with what Daniel just said. Uh, he and I've had this conversation. I think when it comes to hung the Hungarys and the Polands, you know, this world. Uh, at least for the moment, we should at least have veto minus one or veto minus two. So we don't have uh, unanim we don't need unanimity. Um, that's for sure. I completely agree. They shouldn't be able to, you know, be judge and party. And um, it's it's like in the UN Security Council when Russia vetoes. You know, we're in deep problems with that. On the other hand, we need to be careful because the veto for the areas where it remains, which is really not you know, it's mainly foreign policy. I mean, most areas of EU action are qualified majority voting. Taxes, but, uh, budget. Uh, uh, sorry? Taxes, budget. Yeah, taxes, budget. Money. Okay. No, you're right. Money and foreign policy, more money and life and death. Now, you know, I mean, I've, ever since, I've always been a, a kind of a big defender of, of small and medium-sized country. I will always remember the convention in 2001, 2003, where we had, a, I was chairing a group of small countries with Greece and others, Belgium, and all of the smaller countries in the EU. And they really, really care about the small levers of power that they still have. That, you know, big countries, they, they have a veto anyway. Even if it's QMV, do you ever see big stuff going against France or Germany? No, not important things. And so the, the smaller countries, all they have is this veto. So I think if we have veto minus one or minus two, it's okay for them. If you suddenly put everything in QMV and you could go against the interest of a Belgium or a Malta or a Lithuania, you know, then maybe that's a problem. We we need to think really, really hard about this because, you know, philosophically, European democracy is also about the fact that we built an amazing construct where small and medium-sized countries have disproportionate power compared to their size. And that's, you know, against the hegemony of big states. This is what plagued Europe in the 18th, 19th century, big states controlling everyone, invading everyone in Europe. So I think there is a beauty to the power of the margins and the most vulnerable states here that we shouldn't forget. And this doesn't mean I am close to any discussions on the veto. Just think we need to see the full picture. 
Flips have teed it up perfectly, Billy. As an MEP from a small member state, I wonder if you'd nuance anything of what's been said. Yeah, well, certainly, I think in, in existential crisis, um, you know, there has to be some way of addressing, you know, an entire continent being held to hostage by one country. So the veto minus one or minus two in terms of the issues that we are discussing, whereby you're actually debating an issue around the country, but you can't because the country is a veto on that particular issue uh, of such importance. Should we say uh, an issue of foreign policy, the very survival of the of the European Union itself? But I think in general, I have defended the principle of uh, small countries having at the end of the day, a veto. As Calypso said, I, like you will never see a situation in the European Parliament or probably in the Council or elsewhere where Germany or France will be completely isolated on its own because it just doesn't happen. They have the numbers and they have the influence. So I just think we have to think very long and hard. And I've always resisted going to Article 116 in areas of taxation, for example, um, you know, subterfuge ways whereby the Commission are trying to work around the treaties to start discussing taxation through the state aid measures, for example. So uh, that is just fraying away at the spirit and the integrity of what the European Union is about, which is equality among the entirety of member states based on small, medium, size and large. So I, I would be reluctant. I think it would really, really threaten the concept that is there now. It's like, look, the European Union is working. Now, let's be very clear. I mean, we, we all have our views on whether it could do more or less or, or whether we should federalize it or stay as it is or reverse back to more powers to national governments. But in general, the European Union has gone through a financial crisis since 2008. It has gone through um, uh, the Brexit crisis. It went through the COVID crisis. It is uh, now facing a security issue, a humanitarian issue. And it has dealt with it fairly well. You know, overall, it has dealt with it fairly well. Uh, so I don't think we want to be overly harsh on the construct of Europe. But on the issue of expulsion of members, I, I would be very reluctant, generally reluctant, because for every country you, you know you could point the finger at, uh, a democratic election in that country can very quickly change the direction of that country. So in other words, like we had made concerns about Italy, for example, for a period of time. You know, was Italy going to go very right wing? Uh, Maloney got elected. But, you know, to date, you can argue that she's moved to the centre ground and has expressed views that are compatible with most member states in the European Union. Um, Hungary, um, you know, could be an election away from reversing its policies on being anti-European, being pro-Russian and undermining um, the, the social cohesion of, of Europe. So I would be very reluctant to have that sort of you know, two strikes in your out, you know, you, you elect a bad government twice in a row that are anti-European and goodbye Hungary, goodbye Poland. You're saying goodbye to citizens. Like, at the end of the day, you know, governments come and go. We must hang on to our citizens at the very least. And like, even you take Brexit, which was a benign way of leaving, they voted democratically, but there was 50% of them didn't want to go or 49% didn't want to go. So I, I would be very reluctant. I would use every measure. I just come back. I honestly believe that however we work it, we have to get back to um, independent media and independent judiciary as being a cornerstone. And I think it has to be fun. The Daniel made a very, like you leave Budapest, you go to the road. I don't know Hungary as intimately as, as Daniel does, but like if you don't have independent media and independent sources of information that are available to all the, pol all the public, uh, well, then you're always in trouble. And always remember one thing, he who pays the printer calls the tune. And um, we need the printing presses in the hands of the many, not in governments uh, like Orban, etc. So we need broad based media, independent and free. Thanks, man and Billy. Colleagues, I know you are extremely busy. There are further questions I would love to get to. Something from Professor Gavin Byard, from our, our colleagues at the ESRI, and also Derry Fitz, a former Brigadier General at the Irish Defence Forces. But I'm afraid, I think we're out of time, and I'm going to have to just pass these questions on to you all by email. But I've really, really enjoyed this discussion. I hope it's going to be the first of many. And do remember, as I said at the outset, there's two more uh, in, in, in this series that we're organising with colleagues at the EP office in Dublin. Everything you're talking about, democratic resilience and money and funding applies to think tanks and universities as much as it does to yourselves in politics. So we've been listening very carefully to your remarks as well. Um, do any of you want just a, a moment to say anything burning? It's always a bit more challenging trying to manage a panel of people. So Daniel or Calypso, do you want to say anything before we wrap up? All I want to say, Barry, is that you have to promise to have a separate webinar on uh, deliberative democracy and how Europe can be inspired by the Irish example of debate and decision around abortion, gay marriage and all of that. Can we think about that transfer together? 
Only if you can be a, a keynote speaker at that event, Clip. So, and actually, a, a good point on which to end. I'll just draw attention to everyone. I'm sure you're all on on this anyway. But Calypso and colleagues, uh, their work at the EUI Transnational Democracy Observatory is an incredible resource for people interested in these topics. So, give it a Google and have a read. Thank you for all of those who've been in attendance and for uh, the, sorry, Billy. Do you want to say something before I wrap up? No, no. Fine. Cool. Thanks. Just Thank to, uh, everyone who's been in attendance, especially our speakers, Billy, Daniel, and Calypso. And as I said, any questions we didn't get to. I'll share with you by email because I think it's always fun to know what questions you make people think about. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to having you back again.